Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. Kill Team Equinox Chapter 26 The Fallen Hive The Equinox once again descended from the heavens unto the seas of Alvara, shedding the blazing heat of ray entry off her shields and vanishing into a cloud of steam. Stealth Field Online Constantine reported Emperor Willing they will not see us. Nor sense us by other means. Wathin noted, with a slight glare towards Markhas. The space wolf sacks seemed dinner in the man's presence, the Fenris and runes etched into blade and handle no longer gleamed quite so brightly, becoming nothing more than scratches on the metal. What do those mean? Constantine asked, indicating his head towards the runes. My Fenrisian is somewhat... lacking. It's the blade's name, of sorts, and the names of everyone who carried it. Wathin explained. First it was called Fimblewinter, after an ancient Finrisian myth of a winter that would cover the whole of the galaxy for three years, and that this would herald the beginning of the wolf time. The wolf time. Constantine repeated. Is that something that just doesn't translate well into gothic? I. Wathin repeated. But it's a fell time to be certain, regardless of what it's called. The icy hand of the dark gods will stretch out over the galaxy, and their leering grin shall sunder the heavens. For three years, or maybe three hundred, the Eddas are a bit rusty, there will be great catastrophe on every world but then, things will change. Lemon Russ will return, and bring with him the fruit of the tree of life which can heal any harm, and by that restore the Al Father to his full power. And then there will be a new and final crusade, greater even than when the Primarch stood with us and it shall take back the galaxy and wipe the powers of chaos from it forever. An interesting prophecy. Constantine replied. You and Ishvan both seem to have oddly optimistic views on the future. I suppose not having the corpse of your gene father helps, at least what's left of one. True, and the Sons of Dawn are always practical sorts. I think I met one once who said, I've no need for prophecies because I build for every eventuality. Constantine smiled at that. Yes, that does sound like something our older brothers would say. Still, a fell name from a fell time. A fell name for a fell blade. Wathin replied. They're all fell, and no sense in pretending otherwise. Weapons aren't made for times of peace, if such times even exist. We make them for the fell days, for if those are ended, we have no more need for them. Their chatter dimmed as they breached the clouds, and came on unseen wings towards what was left of Hive Tempestus. The first thing that struck them was the silence. Hives are unimaginably loud and busy places, but now, there was only dead silence. The Tyranid had no need to speak, and nothing could be seen moving about in the spires. The grey-black smoke of the Hive's industry was gone, replaced instead with the fetid green miasma of Tyranid digestion pools. The acidic stench of the Tyranid industry was so profound they could smell it through their void hard and hull while still kilometers away. There was little movement to be seen inside the city, but a great deal beyond it. The bridges teemed with Xenos bioforms, diving repeatedly into the seas, or spreading out further to expand their fishing grounds. Morn issued a cursory visual scan, and what returned showed the unnerving adaptability of the Xenos. Already, the fishing bioforms were becoming more adapted, with long tails, maneuvering fins, and bioluminescent lures. They were not perfectly adapted to the seas yet, still capable of moving on land and sea alike to drag their quarry back to the digestion pools. Much of the city was still intact. The Tyranid had yet to focus their efforts on breaking down the steel and stone, though they would devour even that, given enough time. However, there was one massive, Notable exception. The central spire of the city, once the seat of imperial power over the entire world, was completely unrecognizable. It was completely covered in Xenos flesh, a massive tower of meat wrapped about the once proud imperial bastion. 
The sight of it said everyone save Marcus's teeth bussing. Even through the blanks null aura, the raw psychic energy emanating from the structure was impossible to ignore. That explains why there were so few Tyranids. Most of the biomass they harvested must have gone into creating that. Mourn noted. And real, I hypothesize that it is a massive psychic amplifier. Can you confirm that? Yes brother, I certainly can. Andriel replied. The tower was an entirely different thing to his eyes. The raw power coming off of it changed the world. It was less a thing of flesh, bone, and steel, and far more akin to a gigantic pillar of black flame. It drank deeply from the warp, from the depths of the immaterial. There was almost a purity to its power, untouched by the flickering strands of chaos. Pure warp energy, unlike anything he had ever seen before. This would certainly provide the Norn Queen with everything she needs to dominate the planet. It is also likely the source of the spores. Can you pinpoint the location of the Queen? Marcos asked. Inquisitor, what I am looking at is a psychic pillar of energy that can only roughly be compared to a miniature heretical version of the Astronomicon. Andriel responded curtly. But judging by the direction of the energy flow, most likely near the top. At this, lightning flashed dramatically behind the dark tower, its pinnacle hidden amidst the fiercest portion of the storm. Atra looked up at it, and if not for the grim circumstances, might have laughed at the absurdity of it all. They were officially living in a propaganda reel. Because of course she is. Well, let's get up there and kill the bitch. I can't put us directly there, the storm will tear us apart. Constantine noted. But I can probably get us up to within 5 levels, assuming they don't detect us. Once they do, things will become complicated. We will have 64 minutes to reach the queen, kill her, and evacuate before the hive mind is able to redeploy sufficient forces to overwhelm us. Morn noted. Resistance will increase exponentially from the moment we arrive, and after that point, the possibility of survival and successful completion of the mission reaches zero. Resistance will likely consist initially of Hive Guard, Tyrant Guard, and potentially Hive Tyrant and Tyranid Prime Subcommanders. Actually killing the Norn Queen herself will likely require the use of Melter Bombs. We face their most powerful and adept forces thus far. Marcos noted. Fortunately, the fleet is small enough and has proven successful enough that it is unlikely that they will deploy any form of impossibly dangerous creature. Once we land, the Astartes will take point, and the rest of us will cover them. We move with all possible speed. Constantine, is Sergeant Jenkins an acceptable substitute to pilot this craft and keep it out of the way of the enemy? Constantine checked his armor's data logs, skimming through the man's history in a few seconds. If he breaks my ship, I'm going to break him in half. But he's the least likely of any of you to do so. Duly noted my lord. I'll take care of her. Jenkins replied. Do tell her majesty that I send her my regards. I will be certain to sergeant. By the way, if anything unusual occurs, keep note of it. Constantine replied as the craft drew closer. T-30 seconds to engagement. Invoke your litanies to the god emperor, for even in this blighted storm he sees. All men, prepare your hearts and souls for battle in his holy name, and for the glory of his imperium. For on this day, he has granted us the privilege to be his vengeance upon the Xeno, his fury made manifest. The enemies of man shall be crushed beneath your boots, and their mightiest warriors shall fall by our sacred blades. This the holy emperor shall accomplish, and those who die, he shall bear swiftly to his side and to rest eternal. For all those who die this day die in glory, and all those who live, live to bring death unto the enemies of man. Today, we are his angels of death. Today, we are the wings of vengeance. Vengeance for Alvara. Death to the Xenos. Glory to the Emperor. Then with a roar of engines, the fervent marine pushed the Equinox out of her stealth fields and fired her towards the tower at incredible speeds. The weapons needed a moment to come online, then brilliant beams of light struck from the craft and lanced through the corrupted side of the tower. Alien flesh burned to ashes. Steel and gold melted and ran like water. Yet the craft was already cutting speed and coming about. By the time the high fleet could react, 
the Equinox was flying backwards into the Hive Tower, engines firing to slow their arrival. The resulting maneuver set even the Astart staggering, and more than a few of the mortals were violently ill, but they quickly recovered as the Equinox touched down. Constantine nodded to a somewhat wobbly knee Jenkins as he stepped from the cockpit. I don't recommend trying that. You probably won't survive. Wasn't planning on it my lord. Jenkins burped. Show off. Andriel grumbled. Alright chaplain, let's get to work. The fiery arrival of the Equinox had left few survivors. One of the few, a singularly unfortunate hive guard, raised its head, and was greeted with a bolt round as the boarding ramp dropped and the Astartes charged forth. Morn led the way, cerebral cogitator already plotting a course to take them up the 30 floors of the hive spire as quickly as possible. They sprinted through the scorched ruins of two floors, quickly approaching a set of lift shaft doors. Morn lowered his shoulder and smashed into the doors, bending them back. He then stepped back and booted them open. He checked the shaft, then stepped out, boots maglocking to the metal walls of the shaft and charging upwards. The mortals followed swiftly behind, firing climbing cables up the sides of the shaft and beginning to make their way up, save for Jenkins, who raised the boarding ramp and made ready to take off. Once the strike force was clear, the engines fired, and the Equinox slipped clear of the spire, vanishing once more beneath the cloaking field. Resistance arrived almost immediately, coming at the strike team from both sides. Above, the doors began to blow out as the Tyranid started to break into the shaft, large, six-legged creatures, hive guard, emerging from the breaches with impaler cannons leveled towards the team. From below, the sounds of many skittering creatures could be heard. Morn raised his bolters, and opened fire, hellfire round slamming into the Tyranids as they emerged. A few managed to fire, huge bone rounds whipping through the air at deadly velocity. One tore through the side of Morn's arm, ripping away ceramite and the steel beneath. His bolter span from his hand, and the Tetchmarine staggered. A mechanical tendril whipped from his back and caught the falling weapon, as several more set to work repairing the damaged arm. A bolt from Wathen finished the alien. Below, a wave of Termogords, armed with their strange bone rifles, arrived and began to open fire on the mortals as they climbed. Their weapons scratched against the stormtrooper's armor, as several removed grenades and hurled them down into the oncoming horde. There was a violent hissing sound, as a deadly green gas erupted from the canisters, melting through tyrannid flesh and making it run like water. What was left of the termogorns fell in a disgusting rain from the deadly cloud, even their bones liquefied. Aerosolized form of the same thing they use in their digestion pools. Marcos explained to Atra. There is a certain irony to destroying the Xenos with tools of their own creation. The goods woman had little time to respond, before the next wave of attackers arrived. The enemy hurled themselves at the oncoming strike time, quite literally. Huge, hulking walls of flesh and carapace, the tire and guard, flung themselves like living missiles into the shaft, their sheer weight serving as potent weapons in the vertical environment. Constantine leapt aside from one landing on the other side of the shaft several feet below. One on a collision course with Wathin was blown aside as Aishvan fired a crack missile into it. The Xeno fell, bouncing off the sides of the shaft and smashing two stormtroopers to paste. More of the living missiles continued to fall, too many to continue to progress up the shaft. The Astartes broke for one of the doors the hive guard had appeared for, leaping through to escape the onslaught. The mortals, slowed by their climbing harnesses, were not so swift. Recognizing they had no time to make for an entrance, Marcos ordered two of his men carrying melter guns to make them an entrance. As they turned the beams of intense heat to a wall, searing their way into a floor two stories below the space marines, another tire and guard fell towards them. Marcos quickly pulled one of the strange pistols from his hip, aimed, flicked a switch, and pulled the trigger. Atra didn't see any projectile or beam appear from the gun, only a loud bassy sound that reverberated through the air, and a certain distortion, like heat haze. One of the falling Xenos slowed, as if its progress was arrested by some invisible force. Then Marcos jerked the weapon to the side, throwing one tyrant guard into another and sending both out of the way of the stormtroopers. 
the hole was opened, and the mortals quickly leapt through, moving from one attack to another. The floor they leapt onto was almost instantly filled with the sound of scuttling, as thousands of tiny, scarab-like bioforms began to crawl from every vent and electrical socket. They swarmed towards the stormtroopers, who quickly answered with more acid grenades. Those equipped with flamers stepped forwards, clearing a path with Prometheum. Marcus drew his own hand flamer, scouring any that drew too near, when a thud came from the hole. One of the tyrant guard had caught the lip of the stormtrooper's entry, and was pulling itself up. The inquisitor flicked the switch on his unusual weapon, and then fired again. The tyranid suddenly broke inwards, as if crushed by an incredible weight, and the metal deformed, ripping clear as the creature's weight suddenly increased tenfold and it fell with concerning speed down the elevator shaft. Gravity gun? Atra asked as she vented steam from one arm. Gravity gun. Marcos confirmed. Two stories above, Andriel smiled. The Inquisitor's ability to suppress his powers dropped off with range, and at this distance, the effect was lessened substantially. He was still only operating at around 50% capacity, but it was something. He drank in power, like a swimmer taking a deep breath before being submerged once more, and held it close, shepherding it for when it would be needed again. He let it flow through his body, the power of his mind enhancing the strength and speed of his body. The Dark Angel drew his ceremonial sword, and charged alongside his brothers into the aliens as they swarmed to stop them. The creatures here were a step above the gaunts which haunted them before, powerful warriors armed with scything talons and flesh hooks not unlike the ones wielded by the Lictor. He deftly tilted his body as he charged a group of three, deflecting the hooks from his armor as he rushed into melee. His four staff swung, impacting the body of one and hurling it back with a crater where its chest used to be. His sword ignited in warp fire and crackling lighting, lashing out to strike the head from another warrior before the third struck. The blows were foiled by his armor, but the monster was almost as big as he was, pushing him back on his heels before he let the power of the immaterium flow through him. He hurled the creature back and ripped it apart with a bolt of lightning from his sword, moving on without hesitation to the next creature opposing his path. Ishvan and Constantine moved up as a pair, flame heralding the Templar's descent. The pair rounded a corner, only to be confronted by a horrifying abomination. A Xenos that crawled on many limbs, back disgorging spitter-like living minds that raced towards the pair with suicidal frenzy. Ishvan's flame were awed, sweeping away the first wave, then without any wasted motion the devastator marine shifted his missile launcher from his back, loaded, and fired a crack missile into the monster's face. The creature staggered, but did not fall, but Constantine made to remedy that. He charged forwards, blazing blade raised high. Three warriors moved to intercept, but he cut through them with utter contempt, splinting toe in half with mighty blows. The third lunged, but was thrown back, stumps where its limbs had been blazing like paper left near a half. Taking his sword in both hands, Constantine drove the blade into the mine carrier's side up to the hilt, and kept moving, ripping it along the whole length of the monster. The mine scuttlers within exploded from the heat of the bleed, ripping the abomination apart in a cascade of fire and acid. Morn moved forwards without hesitation, his wounded arms functions already restored. His bolters roared without ceasing, but even the potent hellfire rounds required several hits to bring down a warrior. The deadly chemical mixture ripped through their flesh like it was paper, but the beasts refused to go down until they had been reduced to nothing more than a splatter on the floor or their heads had been pounded into paste. Even so, he keep firing and did not miss, even moving at a full sprint towards the staircase, he did not miss. Wathin moved up alongside him cleaving anything that got too close away with swings of his mighty axe. As the pair approached the stairwell, two tyrant guard crashed through the ceiling above, followed by several warriors, one particularly large one in the center, as if the others were trying to protect it. The space marines exchanged a nod, and split. Wathin went left, and Morn right. The tyrant guard interposed themselves between the deadly fire of the Tetchmarine and their charge, while the warriors rushed for Wathin. He met them with a howl and a laugh, smashing into the center of their formation with a deadly blow that nearly cut the center warrior in half. The others quickly moved to flank him, 
but Wathin seemed unconcerned. The Space Wolf stepped forwards, and drove his bolt pistol through the rift he had cloven through the warrior's body. His fist and gun punched through the monster, aimed directly at the Tyranid leader, and he emptied the clip. The death of their leader sent a brief shock through the Tyranid forces, delaying them for but a few seconds, but that was all the marines needed. Wathin tossed the corpse of the warrior aside and got clear as Morn opened fired into the stunned remnant of that squad. Instead, he made his way for the stunned tyrant guard, striking the heads off of the stupid creatures before they could recover. Then they heard a loud, low droning, the sound of great wings beating at extreme speed. They felt a rush of wind and watched a blur rip through the staircase in front of them. It took them both half a second to figure out what the hive tyrant was up to, then then realized and moved, hoping they weren't too late. The first three stormtroopers up the staircase died instantly as the hive tyrant arrived, splattered against the wall and stairs like so much red jelly. Those nearest the door caught a brief glimpse of the barrel of a venom cannon, before it fired and melted everyone in a line stretching back to the other side of the floor. Save for Marcos, who had drawn his Xenoscale cloak about himself, and while the bioacid barrage drove him back several feet, he kept his footing, and cast it aside, scales unmarred by the tyrant's attack. The hive tyrant came through the door, and the surrounding wall, two massive claws lashing out at everything around it. It tore four more stormtroopers in half before the squad fell back and opened fire with everything they had into it. Melter, Flamer, Plasma, and grenades exploded off the monster's hide as it rampaged forwards. It shrugged them off, wings bearing it aloft as it moved to rip them apart. Then it fell, crashing into the ground as Marcos's grav pistol caught the alien in its deadly grip, pinning it to the ground and slowing it significantly. The Inquisitor drew his third pistol with his free hand, and fired. A beam of unbearably bright light erupted from the strange, vaguely serpentine pistol, brighter than a relay's beam, even brighter than plasma. And it did not stop, a continuous beam of deadly light and radiation that struck the monster's wings and deflagrated them. The membranes seemed to disintegrate under the strange weapon's touch, exploding into fire and smoke and permanently grounding the beast. The tyrant let forth a storm of psychic lightning towards the Inquisitor, but it fizzled out in the air, fading away into nothing mere inches from his face. Marcos's helmet seemed to be grinning, as he turned the deadly beam downwards towards the Xenos's face. It hefted the venom cannon towards the Inquisitor again, while also raising its great talons to hold back the lethal ray. But Matthias was at its flank, and opened fire with his plasma pistols, aiming for the joint which held the bioweapon up. It weakened, and then, unable to bear the weight of the weapon under the effects of the grab gun, it snapped and fell to the ground with a crash. Atrus struck as well, power blade cleaving through one of the monster's ankles as it focused on the Inquisitor. The leg splinted under its own weight, leaving the monster crawling towards the skull-helmed instrument of the Emperor's Wrath. It screamed as it drew near, and Atra almost felt as if it were trying to scream something. But then the flesh on its face boiled, and its brain was turned to nothing but fire and ash, leaving only a charred skull as the body fell to the floor. How many casualties? Marcos asked. 12 C my lord. Atra reported, cerebral cogitator providing her the answer automatically. Unfortunate. We need to keep moving. This won't be the last one. The kill team proceeded up the stairs, quickly rejoined by the Inquisitor and what remained of his retinues. They exchanged a brief nod, and proceeded upwards. As they moved, blasting their way through yet more Xeno's filth, a growing sense of dread began to seep into the whole team, setting the hair on the backs of their necks on edge. Only Marcos was entirely unaffected. I don't suppose that'd be your doing Marcos? Wathen growled quietly. You set my teeth on edge enough without trying to. It's not anything I'm doing. We must be getting close. This near to the Norn Queen, her powers may even be able to have a limited effect even within my aura. Marcos replied. Our data on this particular breed of Xenos is understandably limited. The shadow in the warp grows thicker, but there is something more here. Andriel replied. My vision is stifled by your presence. But even through this suffocating veil I can sense it. I do not believe this tower is an amplifier as I once believed. The energy here is focused inwards, 
as if it's trying to contain something rather than push its energy outwards. But in that case, how is it able to sustain the attack? The librarian shook his head. This makes no sense. We've missed something. I can feel it. We are dealing with remarkably abnormal behavior for the Tyranid. Deploying a non queen is strange enough, and the nearest rapport we have to similar behavior would be High Fleet Shyamut, which constructed a similar structure to this one. I do not know. Andriel replied. All I do know is that there is something fundamentally wrong with this hive, and the way that the Tyranid have behaved. We're nearly to the top. We can find out from the queen's corpse. Constantine growled, and they pushed on, reaching the top of the stairwell. More were coming up from behind, and the aura of dread grew even greater. Even Marcus began to sweat under its effect. He ordered his men to use the grenades they had left to collapse the staircase and keep the aliens back. It wouldn't hold them long, but every second counted. The door out of the stairwell was jammed, so Aishvan simply tore it off its hinges, revealing a wall of tyrannic biomatter barring their path. Undeterred, the Inquisitor leveled his pistol and fired, burning a hole through the wall of meat. Lord Morn, what exactly is that thing? Some kind of advanced LAS melter hybrid? Atro asked over a closed comb. Vokite. Morn replied. Very old technology, not manufactured since the Great Crusade. Supposedly, the tech priests of Mars originally intended for such weapons to be the standard for the legions, but they were too expensive to manufacture when bolters were equally effective, if not more so in certain instances. A pistol almost 10,000 years old, and still in good working condition. Imperial technology was rarely pretty or sleek, but it was remarkably rugged stuff. Atra shook her head like the realization, and vented her arm anew. The strain the running battle was already putting on the freshly forged connections between flesh and steel was notable, but not concerning yet. The light faded, and Markla slotted in a new power cell, nodding to the Astartes. The Emperor protects. The Emperor protects. Constantine responded, taking point into the breach. Astartes and mortals alike moved through meters of cramped passageway, moving single file, flanked by cauterized meat. The stench was awful, permeating even through sealed helmets. Then they were through, stepping out into a wet, damp, and foul chamber. This had once been the uppermost floors of the highest spire on Alvara, a mighty palace that housed hundreds if not thousands of servants, and represented the pinnacle of wealth and power. Now it was the den of Xenos, a festering, fleshy hive, with golden marble hanging like flies in countless webs of Xenos mucus. The lights, somehow, still worked, casting weird beams and long shadows across the vast chamber. As the Astartes watched, they felt the strange familiarity of information imparted through hypno-indoctrination. Picked scans taken from devoured Imperial ships recovered from the bowels of the Tyranid hive ships, then burned into their minds layered over the space. They were standing inside a bioship, or at least part of one, fallen to the surface. The meters of tissue had been its skin, and now they stood inside a massive, living organism, playing host to many more. For the center of the vast chamber was well lit, but not by any natural light. Instead, the slender, centipede-like forms of zoanthropes, lesser xenosickers, emitted powerful bolts of psychic energy, leeching power from the walls around them. Multiple hive tyrants flitted here and there around them, administering bolts of their own with odd care. For their target was something most unsocial, and most horrifying. The whole of the Xenos Conclave had their efforts focused on a single being, or rather two entangled beings. The first, and one the Xenos were careful not to harm, was an ugly thing, a massive, bloated alien dozens of times larger than any they had seen thus far. It had wrinkled, pink skin, and a massive abdomen. It seemed too huge to possibly move on its own, though many vestigial limbs indicated that it might have once been mobile in a younger state. Tubes, not unlike massive blood vessels, ran to it from the floor of the crashed bioship, supplying the creature with nutrients, even as sacs along its massive being burst, revealing more larval tyrannids, which were quickly removed from the Norn Queen side by attendant drones. The second thing was smaller, though still massive, and attached to the Norn Queen's head. The lesser tyrannids all seemed to have their efforts focused upon it, 
trying to remove it from their mother. It vaguely resembled a gorge tick mixed with an octopus, with a huge spherical body terminating in many tentacles, which were wrapped about the Norn Queen's face. It was roughly 6 meters in height, and half that across, and its strange body glowed with the impossible colors of the warp. By the God Emperor. Marco swore. Nobody move. Everyone, as close to me as possible, especially you and real. The librarian reluctantly complied, though he began to breathe heavily this close to the pariah. Blood of the lion and blasted curse, that explains a great deal, and also raises far too many questions. Namely, how the hell did one of those get there, and how do we kill both of them? Wathin concurred. Not to show my youth of much, but what in the warp is that thing? Aishan hissed. I'm no sicker, but even I can see that it quite literally glows with the power of sorcery. An enslaver. Sort of a warp born Xenos, not a demon, but not really properly a creature either. Wathin noted. Never fought one, really hoped I'd never have two. I have, and this one is different. Marcos replied grimly. It's about three times bigger, and judging by the amount of effort the Tyranid seem to be exerting against it. I suspect it is exponentially stronger. I cannot tell if it has managed to dominate the hive, or if the hive has adapted it. Neither. Andriel replied. They are fighting, evenly matched. He remarked. Which is also why they have not noticed us yet. The attacks launched thus far must have been under the direction of lesser synapse creatures. Even the spawning of the hooded lictors, it wasn't preparation for the cyclic attack, it was an attempt to keep this thing from calling forth any of its brethren. Are you certain this isn't a demon? Constantine remarked. Because this sounds increasingly like possession. Close, but not quite. I think this one may be older than demons. Andriel replied. Its aura is utterly incredible. I've never seen anything like it. It's easily the equivalent of an alpha level sicker, possibly even alpha plus. The amplifier they've built here, it isn't for projecting an attack out, it's for keeping the enslaver in. At the risk of sounding like an ultramarine, this is largely theoretical. Ishvan noted. Practical, it doesn't appear to be able to move, and I have a rocket launcher. Andriel shook his head. Even I could stop a crack missile or divert its course. This thing wouldn't need to. If it forms a kind shield, that's going to be on par with the titan's void shields. Another practical my lords. One of the stormtrooper reported. We're out of grenades and there's a lot of them coming in fast. Whatever we're planning on doing, we best do it quickly if we want to get out of here. Marcos nodded. Morn, where are this hive's primary plasma reactors? 270 floors below us. Morn reported. Overloading them would result in the destruction of the hive spire, along with all nearby spires, with a 90% mortality rate for everything in hive tempestus. The damage will also be irreparable. So is the life eater virus, and aside from that if Andriel is correct this is our only other option. Fall back, we'll leave out the side and move on the reactor core. Once we arrive, Morn will set it to overload, and then if that doesn't do it I like our odds of killing it after we've dropped it several kilometers a hell of a lot more than trying to fight it and a coven of Xeno sorcerers at the same time. Constantine looked at the Xeno, and then at the Inquisitor. You are telling us to retreat without even facing the enemy in battle, after all that we did to reach here? He snarled incredulously. There is no shame in avoiding a battle you cannot win to fight one that you can. Marcos replied. So yes, I am ordering you to retreat so that we can kill this thing and save this planet. Unless you would prefer to die pointlessly when the world eater virus rips its way into your armor and puts an end to your miserable existence as nothing more than that creature's pawn. Constantine's stance shifted dangerously, and for a moment, there was an extreme tension as it seemed the Black Templar might actually attack the Inquisitor. I will remember this. He snarled, and backed down. Good. Learn from it. Now move before the horde arrives. Marcos ordered, and began making his way back through the hull. Constantine cursed the inglorious and anticlimactic retreat, but recognized the wisdom of the plan. The group pulled back, and the Templar paused only for a moment to turn his hateful gaze towards the creature and curse it. That was very nearly a fatal error. 
This close to the creature, he slipped slightly from the most intense area of Marcos's anti-psychic aura. As he focused on the creature, his hatred caught a flicker of its attention. Constantine began to scream. None of them had ever heard a space marine scream. It was something fundamentally wrong, but it was there, and it was terrifying. Andriel felt the awesome power of the Xeno's mind brush against them, sensing them even through the muffling aura of Marcos. Constantine was fighting it, fighting it with all his hatred and fury but he was a man trying to hold back the ocean. Marcos drew nearer, and Andriel threw his own weight behind the Templar. He felt the rage of the Templar, so bright it made his skin blister, and the ancient, unknowable mind of the enslaver. It turned towards him in turn, but something was holding it back. Then he saw the Norn Queen. And he saw the enslaver. The sicker ceased to see the physical world, and his vision became plagued with memories not his own. Countless eons in the blackest void, a flare of light in the darkness, a turning, motion, then 10,000 years of darkness. The memories also of the enslaver, strange and impossible. The very stars themselves were different, the warp was screaming, screaming with the souls of a war apocalyptic beyond imagining. The darkness there, beneath it all, before the gods, stirred by the arrogance of mortal races. He was vaguely aware that he was falling, that they were all falling. The mortals were all dead, save for Atra and Marcos. The refractor fields of their Aquila and Rosarium respectively had protected them. Several things were broken, his armor was scoured black. His staff was gone, his sword was molten slag. He was falling, falling but he could not escape the memories, he drowned in them, in the war between the two unfathomably ancient minds. They were older than the gods, though she was younger. She was but a body, a daughter born with the memories of millions of years. They were all that, all parts of the great mind, the mind of quadrillions of minds. Vast as the Imperium, so many, still waiting there in the dark. He saw how she touched the warp, how they all touched it, and stirred it up in their passing. They drank deeply from the immaterial, from the deep warp, where even the young gods dared to tread. It was there before him, and beneath him and within him and around him, the tower as an amplifier. It was a door. Then the attack of the enslaver redoubled, filling his mind with fire. He reached for the warp, reached for power as he fell past Marcos and out of his range. He outstretched his psychic grasp towards the Tyranid Tower and desperation, raking at the energy there and drinking it in. It burned and tore at him, the screaming of minds beyond minds, innumerable, but only the surface. Then he was beyond it, drinking in the purity of the deepest black. Yet it was not alone there. Even as he drank it in, that strikes and might, he would not drown in it. For he was soul bound, a sicker of the Imperium, and a son of the God Emperor. Even this deepest darkness could not devour him. Golden and black fire ran through his mind, as he released a scream of utter defiance to the heavens, joining his voice to Constantine's as the two men fought back the enslaver, hearing the choir of the Astronomicon echoing behind them. The effort blew out one of Andriel's eyes and he fell in a corona of warp fire, but they had pushed the enslaver back for a moment, hurling it from their minds. The ground was swiftly approaching, as certain a death as by warp fire. So, he drank in his power, and with the last of his strength tore open a gate between the earth and what remained of the strike force. Darkness swallowed them, then there was cold blue light, pain, and he knew no more. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Morn was the first to regain consciousness, rising with a groan as his internal diagon stick beeped binary warnings on the status of his limbs and armor. The damage was extensive. One of his bolters had exploded in his hand, mangling the gauntlet and fist beneath, and his other bolter was missing, 
Though a lack of damage to that limb suggested that he had merely dropped it. His lower body was operating at less than half its normal capacity, and the integrity of his armor was compromised. He pulled the helmet from his head. It was so badly cracked that a single blow might easily shatter it. Worse than useless now. He surveyed his surroundings. They were located in the hive's main plasma plant, and Real must have transported them there midfall. He reviewed his logs, noting a massive surge in energy less than a minute ago. The Enslaver, or perhaps the Norn Queen, had unleashed a remarkably deadly psychic blast, throwing them all from the spire. The rest of the kill team was scattered about him, alive, but badly injured. Their armor was all scorched black by witchfire. Of the mortals, only Marcus and Atra remained, both carried a form of refractor field that must have protected them from the explosion. He approached Andriel first. The Dark Angel was badly burned, one of his eyes were missing, and his psychic hood and staff had been destroyed. All the hair he had previously was burned off, leaving his face and head a charred mess. He was still breathing, and initial scans showed that while his injuries were severe, he would most likely make a full recovery given time and proper treatment. The Tetchmanine removed his gauntlet. While much of his equipment had been destroyed in the blast, the systems protected by both armor and his iron limbs remained intact. The injector array emerged from the metal limb, and he selected an adrenaline injection to rouse the sicker. No effect. Morn frowned, that should have woken him. It seemed his injuries were more than physical. He was distracted by the groan of Ishvan coming to his senses. Unsurprising, the salamander was stronger and tougher by half than any of the rest of them. He pulled himself to his feet removing his helmet, and tearing away a collapsed pauldron that had become wedged in the rest of his armor. The salamander cracked his neck, then turned his eerie burning eyes on the rest of the group. This is all that left? He asked. It seems so. Morn confirmed. I see your point now about overloading the reactors. Ishvan replied with a groan. I suspect that my missile launcher would have only annoyed it. He checked for it and was pleased to see the weapon was still mostly intact. It wouldn't be nearly as accurate, but it was unlikely to explode. Similarly, his heavy flamer had also survived, though one of the fuel tanks was ruptured. Not going to get much more out of this. Indeed. Morn noted, as he removed Constantine's helmet and prepared to minister to the fallen Templar. His arm was blocked, as Constantine's eyes opened, face twisted in fury. His sword ignited, preparing to sweep up, before he recognized Morn and his wrath abated. Morn, given you look like you just crawled out of a grave, perhaps have a care for when you wake people. The Templar growled, deactivating his sword. Are the rest alive? I'm here. Ishvan reported. And Wathan is still alive, though in bad shape. That was an understatement. Half the space wolf's face was simply gone, burned down to the bone. His armor was also badly dented, breastplate caved in, his breathing was labored, and he began to cough violently as Ishvan tore the destroyed armor off of him, removing the pressure on his hearts and lungs. What about Andriel, and the mortals? Also, get off of me I'm not dead. Constantine asked. Obviously. Morn responded with what the Templar might have taken for a hint of snark if he didn't know him better. Marcos and Atro are the only ones to have survived. Well at least the useful ones are still around then. Constantine growled, pulling himself to his feet. Andriel. Get up. We have work to do. He shouted to the sicker, who remained unresponsive. He marched over to the unconscious marine, grabbing him by the shoulders. Andriel. Andriel, get up. Your duty is not yet ended. Andriel floated. Drifting in the darkness, but not a realm of pure darkness. It was a world of black and white, the two colors entangled in one another, crossed through with things like silhouettes, moving from white to black as they shifted between bands of light and shadow. Beasts that he initially mistook for tyrannids, six-legged and chitinous, some with mantis-like talons. Others resembled emaciated bird-like humanoids, with long tentacles in place of arms. Then a shadow moved and he beheld that it was a massive creature, with no face, but a smooth, blank slate, 
a great humanoid body that terminated in goat-like hooves, and a long tail that moved like a serpent and ended in a body that resembled one of the lesser mantis-like creatures. It held a curved sword in one hand, and a long polyam that ended in a shape like a crescent moon in the other. It looked towards the sicker, hanging naked in its domain, but did not attack. Anathema. It said. Andriel felt his gaze turned upwards, or perhaps downwards. Direction had no meaning in this place. He was perhaps below the universe, or above or behind it. This was the deep darkness, the realm below realms. He had opened the door that Tyranid had built, diving beneath the shadow in the warp. The Tyranid did not serve this place, but they drank from it, from old power, from places where gods feared to tread. He could see the warp as he knew it stretched out below or above him, the myriad lights of the great game, cut through with the blinding light of the god emperor's power. Then a voice spoke, roaring through the void, golden light reaching into the darkness not by might or wisdom, but sheer bloody minded stubbornness. It spoke the name he had taken, not his true name, but one adopted. Andriel. It roared. Your duty is not ended. The voice seemed so very small before this primordial realm. Before the might of the primordial annihilator. But it did not cur, perhaps from ignorance, perhaps from folly, perhaps even from courage. The faceless lord turned, half black, half white, standing between everything in impossible anarchy. It is only beginning. Then Andriel awoke, breathing heavily. See, told you it would work. Constantine said, before offering the sicker a hand up. On your feet brother, we have more Xenos to purge. The sicker shook his head. Already, the fearsome visions were gone, faded like a dream on waking. Only one thing remained that he knew for certain. He had opened the door. And if he needed to, he could open it again. Of the two surviving mortals, Atra was the most easily roused. A simple override code sent to her systems brought her back online, not unlike rousing a servitor. Her head, scratch that, her entire body ached. It was more than just an ache in the mechanical parts, more like a blaring klaxon warning her of the intense stresses her body had just undergone. She silenced the alarm, and then felt a rush of euphoria as doing so also silenced her pain responses. The sudden relief was enough to make her fall to her knees, almost ready to weep. Marcos was somewhat more complicated to rouse. The Inquisitor's Reserius had turned injuries that would have reduced him to paste into simply agonizing ones. He had a concussion, a severe gash along his neck, a fractured skull, all his ribs were broken, and hairline fractures persisted across his limbs, making any movement exceptionally painful. Roused Morn's none to tend administrations, the Inquisitor nonetheless grit his teeth and managed to stand. Atra recovered from the initial bliss, and rose as well. Surveying the environment, she realized that they were the only survivors. Matthias was gone, as was the entire rest of the strike team. Lord Marcus, what were the names of the men who died? She asked. She would not mourn them, not now. Five years in the guard taught you quickly to deal with casualties. If you got broken up over every man who died, you'd never be functional. But they needed to be remembered. Someone had to remember their names. A real person, who remembered they were people, not numbers on a sheet crossed off by a scribe servitor or administratum drone. Not that there was much difference. Well, some difference. Nobody was afraid of a clerk. I'll forward you the details when we're done here. Marka said, grimacing even as the painkillers took their effect. Fortunately, we are at our destination, and the enemy does not appear to know it. Morn, can you overload the reactors from here? It will take a few minutes, and I will have to be... creative. It will also make our presence blindingly obvious as power output will increase dramatically. Once it begins, we will have 642 seconds to board the Equinox and then leave at maximum velocity, otherwise the explosion and resulting shockwave will kill us as well. I estimate it will take at least 300 seconds to reach a point where the Equinox can land, affording only 342 seconds of error. This is normally within accepted parameters, but we are largely down to melee weapons, and are all badly injured. You aren't wrong. I've got maybe a dozen shots between my remaining pistols. Almost all my ammunition appears to have been lost during the fall. 
Atra, how many shots does your arm have? None. The goods woman replied. It's got ammo, but any shot I take with this it's going to be 50-50 whether it goes off at all, and even if it does, the power regulator is damaged. It's about as consistent as an orc sniper at this point. I would advise against underestimating those. Morn reported as he labored over a nearby command console. They can prove unexpectedly dangerous. Work. Wathin growled as he began to sit up. The bloody cog laddie must be more banged up than I am if he's then his response was cut off by a fit of ragged coughs, blood and acid flicked from his mouth. Ah, shouldn't talk, only hurts when I breathe. The old wolf sat back down, saving his strength. Atra stared at the old warrior, genuinely amazed he was still alive. He smirked at her through the half of his mouth that could still move. Don't worry about me lass, space marine, remember? We're invincible. She knew it was a lie, but appreciated the attempt to console her. The screech of Morn's override filled their ears again I am beginning the process. Unfortunately, subtlety is not something we have time for, but I can at least suppress the klaxons from going off, and the Xenos have most likely already disabled the defenses. Energy production is beginning to rise. Contacting Jenkins and the Equinox. Get ready to move. Then the ground began to shake. This is a bit faster than expected. Constantine noted. This isn't me. Morn replied, and began repeatedly stomping on the ground. Trigon incoming. It must be attracted to the energy buildup. Have to draw it here, if it goes for the generators, they might not reach a sufficient charge to catastrophically fail. A what? Atra asked. Then it appeared. A gigantian serpent-like Xeno, burrowing through solid steel, emerged from the ground near Morn's position. It was larger even than the mighty Carnifex, only part of its body emerging to strike, but that one part was easily three times the size of an imperial tank. It was covered in layers of thick black carapace, boasted two colossal scything talons, and just to add insult to injury, its body crackled with powerful static electricity like certain varieties of eel. Oh, for crying out loud, how many different kinds of bug do they have to throw at us? If I started listing them, I wouldn't be done by the time we've blown up. Ishvan reported, training his missile launcher on the creature, waiting half a beat, and then firing. As the beast roared, the missile went down the back of its throat, blasting out the back of its head with spectacular gore. Fortunately, they all seem to like roaring unnecessarily, and their throats aren't as well armored. The ground continued to shake, and another soon appeared near the salamander, and lunged with its mighty claws. Ishvan had no time to dodge, so he stood his ground, dropping the missile launcher and catching the monster's claws with his gauntlets. His armor began to screech as the strength of the Xeno pushed him to his knees. Atra intervened, power sword slashing through one of the talons, unbalancing the creature and allowing Ish to roll clear. He grabbed the rocket launcher by the barrel, and threw it across the room towards Morn. The Tetchmarine caught it, and began to reload as the shaking intensified. Another broke through the selling, lunging down at the marine. Why do they even have this many? Constantine demanded to know as he activated his jump pack and leapt onto the one attacking Ishvan. He drove his burning blade into a gap in the monster's armor, ripping a plate free. This is a water world. There's nothing to dig through. The beast thrashed, throwing the Templar into the ceiling, where he crashed down amid a rain of broken pipes. His fall was arrested by an unseen force, as Andriel stretched out his hand and caught him. The Dark Angel set his brother down, then twisted a pipe into a crude spear with telekinetic force. Taking aim, he flung the spear across the room, driving it into the weak point in the armor Constantine created. Ishvan spied the spear, and tore it free, before charging across the room towards Morn. The Tetchmarine retreated, pursued by his beast, before Marcus fired his grav pistol. The arcane weapon tore the trigger out of the ceiling, bringing it crashing towards the floor. Wathin, limping badly but still fighting, took a wild swing at the alien's side, ripping apart the flesh and scattering armor before the monster's static fled and threw the injured wolf across the room. 
Marcos drew his Vokai pistol and fired towards the wound, deflagrating the alien's insides and causing it to turn from morn, vomiting smoke and lightning like a dragon out of ancient Terran myth. Yet where one dragon charged, another met it, as Ishvan stepped between the Xeno and the Inquisitor, improvised spear braced. The weight and strength of the monster's charge drove Ishvan back on his heels, but with the increased leverage, he was able to keep the monster pinned down for a few precious moments. That was all more needed, as he came about the side, and fired a missile into the monster's temple, blasting it asunder and dropping it with a crash. The rumbling did not cease, and the sounds of many more creatures rapidly approaching could be heard. More were coming, and coming quickly. No sense in staying here to burn with them. Itch, get your flamer and help clear a path out of here. Marcus, if you've got anything left in that tiny one of yours be ready to use it. Wathin ordered. Marcus blinked at the audacity, but now wasn't the time for it. Morn and Andriel, take the rear, Constantine, Atra, mid, and move to the front once the flamers run dry, move. Marcus and Ishvan prepared to move, but Morn hesitated. If the Tyranid damage the reactors before they can reach critical energy, they won't. Go. Wathin ordered. My gene seed is already safely in the vaults of the fang, and I don't fancy becoming a dreadnought with these injuries. They always seem to be miserable bastards. Like hell. Ata replied. If someone needs to stay behind it shouldn't be you. You're too valuable. I appreciate the offer, and your courage lass. Wathin coughed. But you couldn't hold them long enough, and Morn and Ish put in too much work for me to just let you throw yourself away. Besides, there has to be one of you there, after all this, and you're the last one. One of a kind, doesn't get more valuable than that. It has been an honor. Ishvan began, but Wathin cut him off. 500 seconds until this whole hive burns laddie. Don't have time for sentimentality. This is how we all go, and I can't say there's many better ways to go. We'll have time for honors and all that around the Al Father's table. That's not exactly it, but close enough. Morn remarked as he departed. Die well. I plan on it. Ah, Constantine, I'm afraid I'll have to defer our honor duel. The Templar shook his head. The insult is forgotten brother. I shall see you again at the God Emperor's side. Then he turned to go, and heard a sound whip past his ear. The old wolf sax, runes bright, struck into the wall as he went. Carve my name into it, and carve it into the memory of the Xenos across the whole of the galaxy. Wathin bade him. No sense in letting it die here with me. I've been killing Krakens and my Skyvies with a spear since I was a blood claw. The Templar nodded, and then they turned and ran. As they fled, yet another Trigon burst into the control room, this time bringing a horde of smaller creatures behind it. The old wolf raised his improvised spear, and grinned through what was left of his face. Come on you ugly bastards, come and see whether you can face a son of the emperor. For us. For the Alfather. For the Imperium. Suffer not the alien to live. He howled the battle cries of two chapters, and threw himself into the foe. The kill team pressed on, fighting their way out of the power station and racing with all speed towards the exterior. Ishvan and Marcus led the way, flamers opening a path through the tide of lesser tyrannid, scorching aside two waves of charging Jenna stealers. Yet at the third, Marcos's hand flamer sputtered out as its canister ran dry. Undeterred, the Inquisitor drew his power sword and cut down one Xeno, caught another's claws on his cloak, then decapitated it in turn. Ishvan's own flamer ran dry after two bursts more, and the swift Xenos quickly closed the gap as he cast it aside. One drove its razor-sharp claws through the salamander's breastplate, yet its momentum failed before the Xeno could penetrate his ribs. Ishvan then wrapped his arms about the Jenna Stealer in what seemed almost like an embrace, crushing it flat against his chest and dropping the broken thing to the side. He pressed on into the foe, grabbing one by the arm as it struck though it cut open his palm. He swung it like a flail into another, breaking both open like bloated water balloons. Then he caught a fourth by its head, and crushed it in one mighty gauntlet. As the next wave of Xenos approached, Constantine blew past him. Fimble Winter in one hand, and Ad Vigilum in the other, 
he fell upon the enemy in a whirlwind of rage. The axe tore the Xenos apart, freezing their blood in its veins and dropping corpses blackened with frostbite. Its runes gleamed with fury, bright with the spirit of Frenis, and its breath was long winter. The blade was its equal and opposite, hewing the foe with utter contempt. His blows with the burning blade needed not to be instantly lethal, for fire roared across Xeno's flesh like oiled wax, melting the flesh from their wretched bones. Yet the fury was not without price. Constantine had dedicated himself fully to the offensive, and with his armor already damaged, he began to bleed as the Genestilos swarmed about him. Blows to his body, legs, and arms, none severe enough to cause serious injury, but each one adding up. Then Andriel and Atra came to his aid. The goodswoman had loaned the marine her power sword, though it was more of a power knife in his hands. Even so, he wielded it with all the skill and ferocity expected of a knight of Caliban. As for Atra, her metal claw served ably, driven by vengeance and wrath to rip and tear the enemy like a wild animal. She screamed death and bloody murder like a banshee as she tore into the enemy, matching their own feral rage with her own. A Jenna Steeler opened its mouth to bite her, but she drove her arm through its mouth, claws appearing in the back of its throat. Then she closed her fist, and tore the monster's spine out. Covered in alien blood, she seemed utterly unfazed as the wall in front of the lead sortie exploded. A massive carnifex roared as it broke into the hallway and turned to face the party. Come on then you ugly bastard. She screamed. You killed my planet, but you haven't killed me yet. The Xeno lowered its head and charged, a living battering ram too massive to possibly be stopped, no matter how much righteous fury Atra might be able to muster. But while it couldn't be stopped, it could be checked. A crack missile roared from Morn's missile launcher, smashing the beast in the eye and making it stagger. It kept moving forwards, but there was its folly. Constantine countercharged into the creature's blind spot, and taking Wathim's axe in both hands, he clove the beast's leg, severing it at the knee. The monster toppled, rolling down the corridor towards the kill team. Andriel lashed out with what power he could muster against the monster, hoping to stop it. But so close to Marcus, his powers were weak, and he only managed to slow it. But that was enough, as Ishvan charged forwards, and set himself. Catching the living battering ram as it hurtled towards him, he turned with its momentum, and with a shout of extreme effort, hurled the beast over his head, and over the heads of the kill team. He let out a pained axe sound as he recovered. The effort had thrown out his back. Throwing 9 tons of charging alien was a strain even for him. That's what you get for showing off. Andriel noted with a hint of snark as he ran, joined by a slightly slowed and out of breath salamander. Though I appreciate the assistance. The kill team proceeded forwards, approaching the wide exit arch leading out towards a great bridge. Unfortunately, the bridge was of course covered in tyrannids, led by a massive hive tyrant. Absurdly outnumbered, exhausted, and badly wounded, the kill team prepared themselves for one last desperate push. But as they prepared to make a valiant attempt, knowing that their luck was more than likely all but run out, fate smirked. With a blast of blinding light, the equinox appeared, all guns blazing away. Caught entirely by surprise, the hive tyrant vanished under the ship's less cannon blasts falling to the ground with its entire body shorn in half by overwhelming firepower. The craft hovered over the staggering swarm, all weapons blazing away with utter abandon. The boarding ramp lowered, and the kill team made their move. With the foe scattered before them, they leapt aboard. Sergeant Jenkins grinned as he saw them. Boy am I glad to see you my lords. I have no idea what I'm doing flying this thing. It damn near seems to aim itself. Then his grin faltered. Damn, all dead then. This is starting to become a bad habit. My work, are you surviving it? Marcus asked. Get out of the cockpit Jenkins, the city is about to explode. The either very lucky, or very unlucky, soldier complied, and Morn and Constantine took their seats. The equinox turned, and her engines roared. They did not bother with any attempt at stealth focusing their efforts on escaping the city. No tyrannid force could catch them, though many an alien eye turned. As they fled the city, they could almost hear Wathin's laughter following them. 
Then, the world turned blue and white behind them. Everyone brace. A massive orb of blue fire, 10 miles across, covered the city. The entirety of the central spire simply vanished, evaporated by an explosion not dissimilar to the most powerful nuclear weapons possessed by ancient terror. Only the extreme speed of the equinox preserved them, as the shockwave flattened the city, and the wave of blossoming heat, though not the disintegrating fire, melted towers to slag. The great storm over the city was blown away by the shockwave, alien spores perishing as the heat blossom moved outwards. Below, the great bridges were caught up like toys kicked up by an impudent child, thousands of tons of permacrete and steel flying miles into the air. For hundreds of miles, the magnificent constructions from the dark age of technology were utterly destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The death scream of the city, the howling shockwave, tore up the sea, sending waves hundreds of feet high crashing down on the bridges. The blast rippled through the sea, disorienting everything that relied on sonar and effectively deafening all of it. Even in the deepest reaches, the shockwave could be felt, leaving a ears ringing. The blast traveled around the globe six times, each time throwing up titanic waves on the shores of the other hives, killing millions of Tyranids more beyond the billions which had perished in the initial fireball. But even those who escaped that could not escape the psychic backlash as the two creatures all this death had been unleashed to kill perished. Andriel felt their last moments, the last memories of a queen projected out to the galaxy that the whole of the hive mind might know and grow stronger. The pinnacle of the hive spire had begun to fall, searing fire reaching inescapably up to consume them. The enslaver had tried to flee, but now the queen turned her mind upon it in turn. Using all the immense might and unholy spite of the hive mind, she held the creature in place so it could not flee back to the warp from whence it came. Andriel felt something like satisfaction come from her as she died, and felt it himself as the agonized death scream of the ancient enslaver echoed even through the muffling aura of Marcas. Across the planet, any creature with a strong connection to the hive mind perished, as the backlash of their queen's death burst their heads like rotting fruit. The lesser creatures, reverting to feral instinct, fell upon one another, stalking each other through the city streets, and also the badly disoriented and half-mad Alverans, what few remained. Hidden in their fortifications, the Adeptus Mechanicus knew that the kill team had succeeded. Even in orbit, it was known, as the Hive Fleet suddenly flew into chaos at the death of their queen. Half the navigators and astropaths in the Imperial fleet instantly went mad or died as the death scream of the enslaver ripped through the Immaterium with the same force as the explosion that killed the Hive. Yet the effect upon the Hive fleet was far worse. Imperial captains, recognizing their chance, burned full, driving into the heart of the enemy fleet and laying all about with all guns. Broadsides powerful enough to scour all life from continents roared again and again in the night, utterly shattering the hive fleet and bringing all within it to ruin. Yet the kill team themselves had no time to celebrate their victory, as the shockwave at last caught up with the equinox, and threw it aside like a toy. All the void hardened glass in the ship exploded, as did everyone's eardrums. Even the enhanced ears of the space marines could not survive the sheer amount of noise caused by the explosion. Atra and Marcus were instantly knocked unconscious, and Andriel succumbed a few moments later. Constantine fought for vision valiantly, falling deaf as earth and sky spun around him. Morn's own systems, already on the brink of collapse, began failing, and backups and secondary backups also began to fail. Even so, they fought through the pain. Constantine valiantly managed to stabilize the craft as it spiraled downwards, beginning to pull out of the dive before the incredible forces caused his vision to blur, and he lost consciousness. The equinox continued its dive, falling out of the sky as Morn's systems finally collapsed utterly. He remained barely conscious, but was barely able to think, let alone move. He only vaguely perceived it as Aishvan, the only member still functional, managed to pull Constantine off the stick, and take it in a massive hand. Pulling back and to the side, the salamander barely managed to pull the equinox's nose up. With a scream and crash that nearly flung the salamander out of the front of the cockpit, the equinox crash landed on the rubble-strewn remnants of one of the great bridges. It screeched to a halt, sparks flying about her, but she did not break, nor catch fire. Instead, 
she slowly span to a halt. Ashvan, legs flung through a bulwark, attempted to rise, and failed. The Emperor protects. Fuck me. Equinox lives. Then he tapped twice on the floor, and finally passed out. The victorious kill team in their battered, bruised near wreck of a craft, lay in victory, laying bright in the dawn of a new day, amid the scattered rubble of infrastructure that could never be repaired, in a world that was all but dead, in the shadow of an utterly gutted and completely unrecoverable hive. The price was high, but by the Emperor, Alvaro was not yet lost. At least not to the Imperium. Aitla awoke to the sight of metal eyes, and the clicking of something mechanical in her ear. Ag, turn that racket off Al. She shouted, as Mara turned something, and her ear popped. There was a brief ringing, and then normal hearing resumed. Metal eyes, if I weren't so happy to see anybody close to normal, I'd be half tempted to punch you. What even was that? Calibrating a replacement for your eardrum. I'd advise not looking at the side of your head. I still have it mostly open. Mara reported. Atra complied, feeling a bit odd as she felt only a minor sensation as complex and delicate machinery ray assembled her ear. She was quiet and still throughout the process, mulling over the last moments she could remember. It took about 10 minutes to put her ear back together, then Mara pulled away. Maybe avoid throwing yourself into more suicide missions until after you've recovered. You're genuinely quite lucky you didn't start coming apart at the seams, quite literally. I'll try to avoid it as best I can. Aitra groaned, trying to sit up, then noticing something rather important was missing. Two things. One, where are my clothes, and two, where is my arm? Next to the bed, and undergoing repairs. Lord Ishvan and Morn were the ones to create it and their craftsmanship is as difficult to maintain as it is exceptional. Both are recovering as well, though Lord Morn should regain consciousness shortly. How long were we out? Aitra asked. She swung her legs over the side of her bed. If she was as she had been at the start of all this, it would have taken her more than a month to fully recover. But now she did not heal, she was repaired, and that was far quicker. Three solar days. Mara explained. At least that's how long it's been since we achieved victory. Though it looked like you had all been out for a while when we found the Equinox. Are Jenkins and the Inquisitor alive? Aitra asked, donning the robes by her table. There was something to be said for robes. Much easier to put on with only one arm, and quite comfortable. Yes, both survived, and Lord Marcus has, officially, already made a full recovery. Even faster than the Marines? Aitra mused. Though the way you say officially makes it sound like he ordered someone to say he was fully recovered. He's currently in a wheelchair. Mara explained. But that hasn't stopped him from getting back to work. I can appreciate that. I'm guessing we're on the fleet? Aitra hypothesized, and Mara nodded. Well, glad to see you made it out. What happened after the, you know? She made an expanding gesture with her one hand. Boom. You know that time you went utterly berserk, and it took half the command squad to hold you back? Mara explained. That, but for everybody on the planet. It seems most of the humans avoided fighting each other, and for the Xenos, who started fighting each other. We took our chance and took everything void capable we could get and left. We lost a lot of good people in the chaos, but everything important got out, and the defenses we left should keep the ferals from causing too much damage. Aitra let out a low whistle. Well, I don't know quite what I was expecting, but it probably should have been that. Makes sense. Any idea how many are left? Surveys are still early, but it looks like only between 6 and 9 billion from early estimates. Mara replied. I'm sorry, there just aren't many left, and I don't know if any of them will ever really recover. We also lost two titans, and pretty much all the heavy equipment and fleets. 6 to 9 billion, from a population that had previously spanned in the tens of billions. The sheer level of those casualties were beyond human comprehension. It was as a certain warlord of ancient terror had once said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths are a statistic. Wotham's death had been tragic, but it paled before the sheer scope of loss the Imperium had suffered. Nearly the entire population was simply gone, 
and two titans, each of which was worth an entire army of men, had been destroyed. Atra sat down, attempting to process the extent of the catastrophe. Her first thought was to go back to sleep and never wake up. Her second thought was to go find enough Amzek to make sure she never woke up. Then her third thought stopped that. She was, for all intents and purposes, the last Alvarin not apparently regressed into a feral state by the backlash of the enslaver's death. She could not allow herself to succumb to despair and die. So long as she lived, so long as even one free Alvarin remained, Alvaro was not yet lost. And she had not given everything. Her life, her body, her world, and billions of lives just to lose it now at the 11th hour. She had to keep living, until Alvaro lived again. She sat there, considering what to do next. It seemed like an eternity since she hadn't been actively fighting, or preparing for the next fight. For this moment, certain to be temporary, there was peace, and she had no idea really what to do with it. Then, she came upon a simple direct answer. You want to get something to eat? She asked. She was broadly left alone after the pair enjoyed a brief and spartan meal together. Her arm was returned, and Ray fitted by a selection of tech priest, in a ritual that left her smelling on incense and sacred oils. Apparently being one with a holy machine meant that no, the same amount of incense, oils, and ceremony even went into the maintenance of her own bionics. She spied more once, but the two did not speak, and she saw nothing of the Inquisitor, which suited her just fine. She was broadly speaking left in the dark, uncertain of what was going on even in the wider halls of the ship, let alone beyond. Still, various serfs here and there treated her with unusual respect, bowing as she passed them. None barred her passage, and crew parted before her. Whatever was going on, she clearly had the freedom to go as she liked, a truly rare privilege. Most would answer her questions, but often knew nothing. Curious at this turn of events, she began to explore the ship with greater confidence, accessing cogitators and beginning to mentally map the kilometers of passageways, gathering scattered reports on the appearance of the Astartes of the Inquisitor. There were several spaces she was still barred from reaching. One, based on the particular noise and high presence of Mechanicus, was most likely the Inginarum, restricted for obvious reasons. Another she did not understand at first, until she recognized a series of sigils on the door is similar to the ones near the astropathic choir on Alvara. That must be the location of their choir in turn. She considered what to do next. She wasn't even entirely certain what she was searching for as she explored the craft. She wanted to know what was going on, but the crew were broadly ignorant. They knew that they were still in real space, but most didn't even know what system they were in. There were likely only a few people on the ship who knew what was really going on both with Alvaro and her personally. And as evidence increasingly suggested that the space marines had left the ship, moving to one better suited to aid their own recovery, that meant there was just one, which, given his ability to suppress psychic powers, would probably be found as far from the choir as possible. Following that logic, she began to investigate from the furthest points possible from the choir, working her way inwards. She interrogated crew on any senses of unease or areas where increased superstition seemed to be occurring. Tracing the patterns of disturbances, she at last found her quarry. Opening the door into a small room in an otherwise insuspicious corner of the craft, she found the Inquisitor sat behind a small desk, accompanied by a small mountain of paperwork, a servo skull, and a whirring cogitator. Well done. He remarked with a faint approving smile. Of course you're expecting me. So, before we get to what the point of this little test was, the actual reason why I'm here. What in the god emperor's name is going on with my planet? Well, it is my job. Marcus said with a shrug. As to your question, I'm in the process of trying to figure that out. At the moment, we're still gathering information, and as many Alvarans as we can. We're moving them off-world onto holding vessels until we can determine their state. This isn't exactly a standard enslaver invasion, and your people are proving themselves to be remarkably resilient. They've begun forming into bands, and attacking anything Xenos that they come across, but don't attack any Imperial forces and have been docile thus far in captivity. 
It's too early to say whether any of them will make a full recovery, but their loyalty is still fully intact, even if their minds are not. As for planetary infrastructure, the bridges are largely damaged beyond recovery, all hives have suffered extreme amounts of damage, and hive tempestus is completely irrecoverable. That pile of paperwork there, from inches 2 to 6, are documents pertaining to scrapping it. Worse, the tyrannid organisms appear to be fleeing into the oceans and becoming part of the ecosystem. We'll never be able to properly root all of them out. If I had to guess, within a few centuries of recolonization the system will be redesignated as a death world. Recolonized. Eight were repeated. So then, what is it now? Officially, it is now listed as unpopulated. We are pulling out as many Alvarans as we can, but there are so few left that within a few decades any left on the world will have gone extinct. Repopulation will have to come from other sources, most likely a combination of Caden, that was the stock for this most recent colonization, and probably Catalchins. The Administratum seems interested in crossbreeding those two stocks to see what happens, and if it is redesignated as a death world, it will likely produce some of the finest soldiers in the Segmentum. Though with the paperwork involved, that likely won't occur for at least 200 years. The planet will likely never fully recover, but we might hope for 60% output after about 500 years. So that was it then. Alvara was not yet lost, not to the Imperium, but to the Alvarans, who themselves might be beyond recovery, it certainly was. The planet itself would live, but forever altered by the alien invasion. Alvara had passed a Rubicon not unlike her last daughter. Neither would ever be the same again. You will be remembered. I fully intend to see to it. Marcus said after a long moment. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten, and I will do all that I can to help your people. It is my duty to protect the loyal citizens of the Imperium, and while many may be sacrificed for the wider whole, such sacrifices are never to be made unnecessarily. Your people's loyalty, and your own, is without question. Which brings us to the purpose of this test. Your loyalty and courage is exceptional, particularly among the standards of the guard. Your service record is remarkable, and you have demonstrated extreme intelligence, drive, and faith, as well as a hatred for the Xeno that I have rarely witnessed outside of the Adeptus Auratus. Furthermore, you clearly possess information gathering skills, as can be demonstrated by your ability to find me on a Lunar class cruiser. All these skills indicate that your potential far surpasses the normal requirements of the Imperial Guard. I would therefore offer you the opportunity to serve the God Emperor more directly, as an acolyte of his most holy inquisition. Atra blinked. She had a feeling that this was some manner of test, but had not expected her reward to be such a singularly high honor. While she knew relatively little of the Inquisition beyond its fearsome reputation, it didn't take a genius to gather what acolytes might one day become. A full Inquisitor, one of the most powerful individuals in the entire galaxy, answerable only to the Emperor himself. I appreciate the offer. She replied. What would my duties in this new position entail? The Inquisitor smiled at that. Acolytes fill a wide variety of roles each according to their own particular specialization. Given your skill set and the fact that you're one of the few mortals to have earned the respect of the Space Marines, you would most likely continue in your present role alongside Kill Team Equinox. You would officially act as my liaison, my eyes and ears, and given prior command experience with the Guard, also could potentially be deployed alongside Imperial Guard formations in particular engagements. You would act as representative, warrior, and part of forwards intelligence. Continued training will of course be mandatory, and you may also be deployed independently for your own missions, or alongside other acolytes, which you will learn more of as is needed. For operational security, my acolytes are broadly ignorant of one another unless required for a particular mission. Atra considered. So, do what we just did, again? Well, this last mission was abnormal, in many ways. Marcus admitted. I figured as much. Based on how you all reacted, finding one of those enslavers stuck on a Norn Queen isn't exactly common. Unheard of, actually. I fully intend to continue investigating the cause of this abnormality, though I fear it may be the work of a fouler design. Then I have one condition. 
Ata replied. When you find whoever was responsible for creating that thing, for unleashing that horror on my world, I get to be part of the team that brings them down. Your only request is for vengeance? Marcus asked. I think I see why Morn likes you. He offered his hand. You will have it. Welcome to the Inquisition. When Atra set out on the first day of her new job, she went out in new armor. Closely based on her new master's own Xeno hide armor, and formed of Harley plates even stronger than her old carapace armor, the armor was all black and silver, freshly painted and anointed with all sacred rites. On her left shoulder, she bore the stylized eye of the Inquisition, and on the right, the swirling blue dragon of Alvara, a standard that she knew now she would not be the last to bear. Power sword at her hip, mechanical arm charged. She entered the hangar of the Lunar class cruiser, watching with a wide grin as their ship arrived. She had been freshly painted in the colors of the Death Watch, poured over by the adepts of Mars and found worthy of service. The proud young craft set down, and boarding ramp lowered. From her depths emerged four warriors, armed in divergent colors no longer, but now united in the colors of their newly forged brotherhood. Only their right shoulders bore the marks of their parent chapters. The cross of the Templars, the dragon's head of the salamanders, the iron fist of the iron hands, and the wings of the dark angels. Constantine walked with his sword at one side, and his axe at the other, a new set of runes graven onto the bleed, the name of an old and mighty wolf, whose owl had shattered a hive fleet and set a world free. Ishvan bore a new, slightly tweaked heavy flamer, with a head like that of a roaring dragon. Morn's panopoli was as simple and effective as ever, though Atra did note with some amusement that he kept the missile launcher in addition to his twin bolters. Only Andriel's weapons had changed. He bore his staff no longer, but now carefully forged for sword, similar to her own power weapon, but specialized to channel psychic powers. She saluted, but did not bow, and neither did they. Acolyte Atra. Constantine mused. I see you have made a full recovery. We may resume training with full intensity. He's getting tired of knocking the rest of us down. Andriel replied with a slight smile, then a nod towards the acolyte. So then, I believe we have Xenos to kill. Well, at least you aren't trying to kill one another any longer. I shouldn't sighed. But it seems that your never-ending battle continues. Our vigil is long, the night dark, but neither are without end. Morn replied, and Aethra almost swore he was trying to make a joke. And our next mission will be a return to the Watch Fortress. We are down a member, and I have communicated arrangements for a new brother to join our cause. And then, at last, back to war. For we are Death Watch, the Angels of Death, and in the Emperor's name, we shall not suffer the alien to live, no matter where they may hide, or what realm they dare trespass. Morn concluded. And we are Equinox. We are the point of balance, and we are the turning of the tide. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.